So, ladies and gentlemen, or just to let everyone know, you are being recorded at this time for quality assurance. And um, when we last left, um, the uh, we basic basically what had happened is that we had started talking about. I mean, we started on the slide that talked about stock redemptions. Um, excuse me, sorry. Um, I wanted to find out if there were any questions about. Uh, anything that we cover in the last class or um, anything else in general before moving on. And if you do, please, uh, you know, either share them with me in the chat window and I'll try to address them. Or if you want to, you can just turn your mic on and uh, ask the question in general. All right. Hearing none, I will go ahead and proceed. All right, folks. So basically, what we're um, what you're seeing here is that you know we were going to talk about stock redemptions. Now we had talked about there are two different types of distributions that you can have. You can have what we call the liquidating distribution, and then you can have the um, uh, the non-liquidating distribution. Obviously, this chapter talks about the non-liquidating distribution. Um, and the reason why, and I told you guys, the reason why I chose this chapter is because more likely than not, during your time as, a, as an accountant, this is probably what you're going to run into the most. Now... What you get paid for the most is going to be the liquidating distribution. That's going to be because basically what's happening in the liquidating distribution is that you're you're, you're shutting the company down completely. Um, and the reason why I say you're getting paid the most there, <coughs> excuse me, and the reason why I'm saying that you're getting paid the most there is because, um, I mean, nobody's going to calculate, I mean, nobody's going to pay you to to do a whole lot of work with the distributions. Most of the time, the controllers of the organizations that do distributions know exactly what they are. Um, unless you're talking about a small, closely held corporation, which, which um, you know, they do exist. Uh, you know, so 80% of businesses in the United States are what the, what the um, SBA classifies, or not SBA, but what the Department of um, Commerce classifies as small businesses. And so the small businesses that... Um, you end up seeing here is 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 um, you know and they can be organized any way. So if you have a small business that's organized as a corporation, these are some things that you might actually run into. Okay, and they say here individuals generally prefer. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, back up. Sorry, sorry. I, mean, I was getting a little ahead of myself. So the so here we're going to kind of talk about stock redemptions. Now, obviously, this is not a liquidating case. This is basically what's happened is is that you know, the corporation has issued a whole bunch of stock and they say, OK, we're, you know, and, and, and we see this in the public sector a lot. Uh, it does happen in the private sector a lot. Also, public sector of uh, company, or public companies do this a lot. And in fact, I know there's been some 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 uh, hubbub on the news about how I guess there was a, a couple airlines who had just done a stock redemption probably within the past. I want to say it was almost four or five months before this whole COVID thing happened. And, and they're catching a little bit of grief because, you know, they said, well, they did a huge stock buyout. Well, now they need money in order to survive. Well, if they just kept the money, they would have gone on. I'm not trying to make a judgment whether they are right or wrong to do it. All I'm trying to say is that this is something that you probably see more often in the news than you would imagine. But what ends up happening is, um, you know, and again, what sometimes what will end up happening is, is that they've got, um, you know, they just realize they have a lot of cash on hand. There's two ways that they can do deal with that cash. One thing they could do is they could just issue a dividend to everybody because under the federal law, um, excess cash can lead to where the, um, uh, the, the, the IRS can come back to the, the corporation and say, you have too much cash. There's no reason for you to have the cash. You need to issue a dividend in order to get it out. And that's, and that's a, that, that, that actually does fall under the rules 
Uh, I can't remember the exact code section right off the top of my head. If anybody's interested in it, I'll, I'll be happy to get it to you. But it's it's it it is something. And actually, um, the the probably the most famous company that was running into this problem. Um, most of you were probably still in elementary school when this happened. But Microsoft back in uh, I believe it was two thousand three two thousand four um, was running into this problem. And, and again, I think, and I've probably shared this story with you, where um, Microsoft issued their first dividend, and you know it was it was like big news because they had done their first dividend. But Bill Gates had for years said, "Look, we need this cash because we're trying to expand and grow operations." Well, when you're one of the number, and I think at that time he was the number one size corporation in in the world. It's kind of like, yeah, um, yeah, we're not buying that anymore. So I, I think he got to the point where. They they had decided it, but but Microsoft as a as a as a culture had never wanted to do dividends, and and unfortunately the IRS rules kind of forced them into it later on. Now they do dividends all the time, so it's not a big deal. But uh, if you have a lot of excess cash, and instead of doing a dividend, something else that you can do is you can you can buy back your shares. And most of us have seen how that works on the financial side. Um, you know, you buy the shares, they become treasury stock that you that you have to report separately in your in your um in your uh, in your equity section of your uh, financial statements but but what happens from a tax perspective is is a very interesting thing and, and and you can tell this has 11 slides i mean there's not very many topics that go the you know crazy deep into stuff that for something that would you know on the face seem so trivial and so the redemption occurs when a corporation acquires stock from a shareholder in exchange for property property in this case being cash for the most part um you know I mean, in theory, you know, if, if I'm a, sh a corporate shareholder and you're holding a piece of land that I really like, uh, I can go to the corporation and say, hey, look, I want that land. I've got these shares. How about I give you the shares? You give me the land. We're all done. Um, that's that's an entirely um, feasible option for all of this. Uh, but for the most part, this is going to happen in cash. Um, you're not going to see this in anything else other than cash. Um the redemption either results in a dividend or a sale of redeemed shares. So uh, individuals generally prefer exchange treatment because of the preferential capital gains treatment. And uh, corporations generally prefer um, uh, the dividend treatment because of the, the dividends received deduction. Um, you know, I, I, I've looked at this slide, and I'll be honest with you, I've never really dealt with this from an individual perspective other than Somebody just coming out and saying, hey, they redeem shares, here's cash. And usually the way they've done it is that it's it's always been, you know, the um, it's always been the preference. I mean, it's always been the exchange treatment. I've never actually seen what happens when it, when it happens to an individual that's um, that goes for dividends. But I would assume that if the corporation is a qualified corporation, why wouldn't they get the capital gain rate anyways? I, I just don't know. Um this, like I said, this happens so infrequently that, that we mostly, like I've never actually had to deal with this. Um, and, and usually the times that I've I've seen where stock redemptions have taken place, it's usually seen as a, as a, uh, as you know, getting the exchange treatment. So it is, uh, you know, there it is what it is. Um, stock redemption. There's so there's three types of redemption. There's substantial. There's redemptions that are substantially disproportionate or treated as sales. Redemptions and complete redemption of all stock of the corporation owned by the shareholder and redemptions that are not necessarily equivalent to a dividend. And we'll examine all three types of those here. The stock ownership. OK, well, actually, before we get into all those, let's talk a little bit about the stock ownership tests are required for treatment is a substantially disproportionate. Uh, shareholder does not control the corporation after the exchange. In other words, they have less than 80, 50 percent. And the shareholders voting stock and aggregate value is less than 80 percent. Most people uh, are going to qualify under this if they if it's a publicly traded company, because, you know, 50 percent or more is probably not going to be. Um, I mean, unless you're doing, you know, I don't even think Bill Gates is allowed to, 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 to own more than 50 percent of his company anymore. So it's it it, it is what it is. Um. Oh, this is a, so this slide right here is important for a couple reasons. Number one, they're talking about constructive ownership rules must be considered family attribution, attribution from entities, um, and other types of attribution. This is a very good time to talk about a very important concept within the tax regime. And that's this idea of attribution. Um, 
attribution is not one rule. And I think that there's been a, a, a little bit of a mistake that I've seen in the past. And I, and I actually, I caught this before we did anything crazy. Uh, I remember when I was working at KPMG, we were working at a, on, a, on a tax return. And, the, you know, the question of family attribution for a particular um, uh, class, uh, you know, class of entity, uh, I'll, I'll get into the full details of it. But, uh, you know, and it turns out they were using the traditional attribution rules and not the international attribution rules as they should have. Um, but as a result of which, I mean, it, 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 well, it was actually because the attribution rules under the um, under the um, uh, international rules was actually uh, far more favorable to the client. And luckily, we figured that out before we had to go back to the client and tell them, hey, look, we got some bad news for you because, you know, and then once we re realized that it was it was it was, it was a good deal. But there's different there's different rules of attribution that take place. I know they're not talking about that here in the slide. I'm just bringing it up to you because um, it's funny. You know, most people when they talk about attribution, I want to say, give me one second here. But I want to say. That um, oops. Oh, actually, I'm in the wrong area. Let me take a look here. And I'm trying to remember which code section it falls under, but generally, um, yeah, so code section 267 actually has some attribution rules. There's some additional attribution rules. I thought, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but I thought that there were also some attribution rules. And I'll, I'll give me one second here. Yeah, so there's also some attribution rules, constructive ownership of stock under code section 318. I thought it was 318, but I didn't want to make I didn't want to say it and then be wrong. Um code section 318 uh deals with constructive ownership of stock and 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 there's certain international rules that will fall under this and then there's other attribution rules like I said that that have different ways of doing it. And oftentimes what happens is it's the definition of what is a related party. Okay? So when you start talking about family members, for example, you know, Code Section 318 is going to talk about, you know, spouse, children, grandparents, basically what we would call the silo version of things. So if if it's me, my kids, my grandkids, my great grandkids, technically um, would be all a related party. Cousins, not a related party, according to this. OK, so. Um, you know, so, you know, and when I say siloed, you know, it's it's basically it's it's all vertical cousins and brothers and sisters and all that sort of stuff is 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 kind of a different um, different area. Now, um, the, the the whole thing of it is, is that you have to figure out which rules are you supposed to be playing under when it comes to these attributions. And 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 like I said, I've, I've seen it several times in the in the past when I've talked with um other tax professionals that sometimes are using the wrong rules. Um, so usually when we start talking related party, the first thing I start asking is, okay, related party as defined by what? Um, and sometimes that saves the day. So there's a little bit of tidbit of information for you. Okay, so they have an example here. Tom owns 60, 60 shares of the, 100 shares of the common voting stock. What percentage uh, test must be met for Tom to receive exchange treatment? And again, it's... Um, uh, actually, I'll just I'll just go to the solution. First, the the redemption must own less than fifty percent of the of the shares afterwards, and then second of all, Tom's percentage of ownership after I'm sorry. First of all, Tom Tom yeah after the redemption must own less than fifty percent of the outstanding shares, which in this case he would if if he redeemed the whole thing. Second, Tom's percentage of ownership after the redemption 
must be 80% of this percentage before the redemption. So Tom's 60% drops to less than 48%. 8 times 60% 48, uh, is, is to 48%. Okay, so that's that's kind of what they're talking about here in terms of how would he get exchange treatment in order to do it. So to determine the number of shares to be redeemed, uh, solve the following equation, blah, blah, blah. And I'll let you guys kind, of, guys kind of read this. But this is how this ends up happening. Like I said, this doesn't happen very often. It's a good idea to go over it. Um, yeah, so here, here, actually, this is where they're trying to say, you know, note that the ownership is determined using code section 267, subsection C. I was talking about 318. Uh, that was the first code section that I saw when it came to the attributions. Um, so let's take a look at what that is. Um, and for those of you who don't know, basically what I'm doing is I'm on checkpoint. So 267, subsection C, constructive ownership of stock, So an individual shall be considered as owning the stock owned directly or indirectly by or for his family. Now, the family of an individual shall include only his brothers and sisters, whereby whole or half-blood, spouses, ancestors, and lineal descents. So this one, unlike what we saw in Code Section 318, is a little different. Um, this is where brothers and sisters can actually be put in, but code section three, you know, you know, um, code section, uh, uh, 318 is different in that it does not include brothers and sisters. And so as a result of that, uh, you, you kind of got to understand how, which rules you're going to end up playing under. And part of the reason for that, whoa, sorry, you're not supposed to see that. Um, part of the reason why you're supposed to, um, you know, part of the reason why you're supposed to um, uh, just make sure that you're following the correct rules, it, it is very important in order to um, make sure that, that things do um, succeed as a result of that. Okay. So tax consequences of the distributing corporation. Current EMP is reduced by the dividend distributions for an exchange. Current and accumulated EMP is reduced by the the uh, percentage of, of stock to be redeemed. This is one of those times that no, sometimes what will end up happening, and I'm, I'm, I'm and I know I'm probably kind of beating a little bit of a dead horse. In practice, what's going to end up happening is that sometimes accumulated earnings and profits and, and current earnings and profits, they're not really going to give a whole lot of attention to it. My personal opinion, we always should. But as, per, as a person who just spent yesterday trying to piece together a last minute um, tax return so that a client could file his tax return um, so that they could um, apply for a, a, a government grant, sometimes what ends up happening is that, you know, and especially if you're not getting the, the final information until la the last two to three weeks of the filing deadline, you're, you're, you're going to see that there's going to be a lot of temptation to just kind of press the button and move on. Um, this is where you might be given a task to say, okay, we want you to calculate um, accumulated earnings and profits based off these old tax returns. Another thing that will end up happening is, say, for example, um, the client loses the rec records. Maybe the only thing that they have from their tax return is page one and, you know, page one through five, and that's it. And they don't have the accumulated earnings and profits um, uh, calculation done. Or, or they're just missing the data, and so they they ask you to do this. Um, it, it's a very common um, project that we end up running into. It's also something that, from time to time, um, you know, we'll we'll do in in, in other areas also. Um, uh, when we talk about the partnerships and all that sort of stuff, we talk about passive losses. Um, passive loss carry forwards. Oftentimes, what will happen is, and usually you'll you'll see this when people do their own tax returns. So obviously in corporations, you're not going to see that too much. Most corporations are too chicken to do their own tax returns. I've had one or two clients that they, that they'll do it just because they want to save a little money. They think they can get their stuff done right. But for the most part, um, they're not going to do it. But when you start seeing that people are, um, uh, you know, you know, the passive loss carryover sometimes don't get carried over correctly. And as a result of which you could have to go back and do some reconstruction. So this reconstruction kind of project 
it happens a lot with or with accumulated earnings and profits. It also happens a lot with passive losses and, and to make sure that we've got the right number going forward. So anyways, just some little tidbits of, of thought. Okay, so then you have a partial liquidation. We didn't talk about liquidations in general, so I'm not going to get too far into the weeds about this. But um, basically what can end up happening is that you, you know, you could have a partial liquidation um, with, with, you know, distributing stock or selling a business item and, and distributing the proceeds to the shareholders. So very good example of this would be maybe I have a corporation that has three divisions. I have a division that sells product in Europe, one in the United States and one in Asia. And the one in Asia is um, by far our most profitable. And so we've taken a look at our European operations. We're not happy with it. Uh, it's not been doing very well. So we we contract with a German company to come purchase um, our European operations. They pay us an exorbitant amount of money for it because to them it's extremely valuable. To us, we're not making as much money off of it. And so they they pay us money for it. We take that money and then we say, look, we're going to go ahead and distribute those proceeds to the shareholders in a partial liquidation. Um, I, I, I've, again, this is one area that I probably, you know, don't have as much experience as I would like. I participated a little bit on one project, but it's, it, you know, it's, you know, it, it's almost like saying that I'm a Vietnam veteran because I stepped on, uh, you know, Da Nang Air Base at one point in my life. Um, I, I just don't think that it's probably a very good analogy to be able to say, yeah, I've got a lot of experience with this because I touched one part of the project. That, that, that would not be the case. But, you know, you, I think you kind of get the theoretical gist of this. Again, you're probably not going to see these too often. And usually if you are as the staff accountant, you're not the one who's going to be dealing with this. Uh, more likely than not, it's going to be the senior manager and the manager is going to be dealing with most of the of the aspects of this and then telling the senior who has more experience, hey, this is how we're going to execute this. This is how you need to fill out the tax return in order to get that done. Okay, so this is going to be the end of Chapter 18. Give me one second. Again, I had all this stuff set up before. Now I just got to find it again. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about forming and opening partnerships. Okay, so corporations, for the most part, if you get into corporates, um, okay, so let's step back a little bit. There are certain areas of the tax realm that you can sort of specialize in. Um, one area that's a very common area of specialization, of course, is corporate taxation. And that's because and I, I remember one time um, I was at a firm. I won't name the names because I don't because I'm going to kind of embarrass the person for what they did. And I remember I had been at the firm for probably all of about four months. And I, but I, they had given me a whole lot of individual tax returns to do because they knew that was my area that I had worked on in the past. And I remember this person who had been, uh, she had been a CPA probably for about 15 years. Um, she had done a lot of corporate tax return work. And then all of a sudden we kind of had this inflow of individuals. And so they asked her to do some individual stuff. And she was coming and asking me where to put things in tax software. I will tell you, there's nothing that's more, um, more expanding of my hubris than <laughs> to have somebody who's got 15, 15 years of experience as a CPA asking the, the you know, the, 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 the new uh, employee, where do we put things in the tax return? Um, it, it was, it was wonderful. And I know, I know some of you are kind of like, wow, how petty. Well, I, I mean, you know, sometimes you take your, <laughs> you take your happiness where it was. I think it was very funny because that same person used to get on to me because I wouldn't put things right or in the correct place when it came to corporate taxation. Well, that's because she was an, she was an expert at entities. Um, she knew all of the rules and reg requirements and regulations in order to get the tax returns to work for entities. 
And I, and I think that the way that she, you know, she was very, very smart person, but um, you know, and I've, I've actually kept up with her a little bit and that's the reason why I'm kind of defending her name and the location where she works at. Cause I do like her. Um, and, and she's good with that. Um, I see. I got a question popped up. Yeah. You show her <laughs> way to go, Andrew. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. And I, I, I look, I, I'm, you're talking to somebody who's in the middle of a Facebook feud with some family members because they, I don't know. I've got, I've got some weird family members. Let's just say that it, me, I'm the, I'm the practical, the business oriented person. I have some people who, well, I, I don't want to make fun of people and what they major in, but they're, they're definitely, um, shall we say cut from a different cloth. Um, you know, but they, they, and they kind of judgmental, but anyways, I, you know, yeah, I get it. But that's the cool thing about us accountants. If you, if, if you're a judgmental individual, you're in the right industry. If you're doing accounting, because, uh, because people are very judgmental in accounting. Um, I tend not to be just because I I've known, I've known what it's like to be judged, um, you know, unfairly. And so usually I try to, you know, I try to steer clear of that. Not that I'm not willing to, you know, poke and prod a few of my family members every now and then, but anyways, that's, that's, that's not the point of the class. Um, you know, another specialty that you can get is what we would call flow throughs. Now flow throughs, um, generally is going to be your partnerships and it's also going to be your S corps. And we'll talk a little bit about forming and owning partnerships here, but on the grand scale of things, a very common question that you're going to get is, hey, I've started my own business. What kind of an entity structure should I form in order to do this? And generally speaking, the way that we look at it is, I don't know, it depends on what you want to do. First of all, if they're, you know, in order for a partnership to exist, you have to have two or more people, which makes sense. I mean, you can't have a partnership with yourself. I mean, I mean, I, I remember in the past reading st stuff about actresses who married themselves, um, but, you know, I, which I've never quite understood. I mean, how can you uh, how I mean, you know, as a husband, I don't know how I could lose an argument to my spouse uh, if I'm just married to myself. I'm always going to be right. Um, but but the fact of the matter is, is that, um, you know, partnerships, you have to have two or more people. But partnerships work almost exactly from a from a theoretical standpoint. The partnership and the self and the sole and the sole uh, sole proprietorship, blah, excuse me, um, really receive the same tax treatment. The primary difference between the two is that in a partnership you have to divide what happens in that, whereas in the sole proprietorship you just throw it on Schedule C and it's done. But if you if you took a business that is a sole proprietorship, took the exact same business and put it on a, as a partnership that's more owned by one or more people, it generally is going to have the same tax treatments regardless. OK, now there's a few things that we can do in partnerships that we can't do in sole proprietorships. And we'll get into that here in a little bit later on, too. Getting back to sort of the the the, the specialization and why you would uh, choose a partnership over anything else. The biggest problem that we tend to have with sole proprietorships and partnerships is self-employment taxes. Self-employment taxes, as you know, is a 15.3% uh, tax hit. And as a result of which, uh, it can be a pretty painful and surprising um, first tax bill that a lot of businesses get, especially if they're profitable within the first year. Um, and if they're not planning for it, they, they can actually, this I, I've seen where, um, people have actually gotten themselves into a lot of trouble because they had a, um, uh, you know, the partnership, you know, or not a partnership, but the, um, but the tax return came back and they said, gosh, I only made $15,000. Why are you telling me I owe $5,000 in taxes? Well, the reason why you owe $5,000 in taxes is because you have part of your, 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 um, uh, you know, part of your income is being taxed at income tax rates, and then it's also being taxed at self-employment tax rates at that flat rate of 15.3%, up to, of course, the Social Security maximum, which is standing at about 129, I think it's 129,900 this year, whatever it is this year. Um, I, 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 if I see the number, I'll recognize it, but I just can't pull it off my, my mind right now. But the fact of the matter is, this is one reason why when people say, I'm starting a business, I'm going to sell products online, I'm going to do this online, or I'm going to sell, you know, I'm going to open a restaurant, or I'm going to do all this other stuff. Generally speaking, partnerships are not the preferred vehicle that we like to use for that. 
However, if you form an LLC, and we'll talk about this later on, if you form an LLC uh, and the LLC has two or more members, what ends up happening is 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 that you know the default for the LLC is going to be, um, you know that that it's a partnership. So uh, some people may form a partnership and not even think about it. Now, if we were in class, I would show you how easy it is to form a partnership. And the way that it's easy to form a partnership is, you know, I spit in my hand, you spit in your hand, we shake hands. There, it's a partnership. Um, very easy to get into. And if you take a look at what a partnership is. And there's actually a very, you know, I've I've been one of those who, um, uh, let's see, uh, partnership defined. Let's see if we can get that. I'm trying to see. Maybe I have to pull that up a little bit later on. There's actually, um, uh, da, 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 da. I'll see if I can pull it out of the. Um, when I go home tonight, I'm going to pull my 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 tax book. I I had um, I wanted to uh, yeah, I wanted to have that done. I actually forgot to do it. And I thought I'd be able to pull it up here. Um, but generally speaking, there's certain things that 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 take place now. You have different types of partnerships that exist, and we'll go over a lot of those. But one of the one of the basic ones that you'll start seeing is what's called a joint venture, and that's usually where you have two or more um, individuals or entities that are forming a a um, that are forming a a partnership, for lack of a better word, um, for a specified purpose. Um, the general the, the joint venture rules that uh, that exist within the tax code are going to talk to you about various aspects of this. So, and one of the most important aspects of a, a partnership or a joint venture is that there has to be a profit motive. So for example, if you and I uh, were to shake hands and form a partnership with the intention of distributing shoes to the children in Mexico, um, probably not going to be seen as a partnership. It's going to be, kind of, I actually, we, if, 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 if one of us was a good CPA, we would probably say, look, we're going to form it as a nonprofit. So that way we can have people donate shoes or we can have them donate money so we can go out and buy shoes. And that way they can at least get a tax deduction off it. But that wouldn't qualify as a partnership because there's no profit motive. All, all the only motive that there is, is just taking and gathering shoes and delivering it to, 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 to kids um, who are needy. Um, and uh, and I choose Mexico as a, as a as an example because I have a friend of mine who's actually originally from Honduras. Um, he actually formed an organization to gather shoes to take him to his um, to his native Honduras um, because he he grew up in an orphanage and he still remembers when he was at the age of seven he got his first pair of shoes and for him it was a moment, momentous uh, I mean a monumental. Um, uh, event. So he wants to deliver that same experience to kids in orphanages. So um, again, it wouldn't be a profit motive. Therefore, it's not technically a partnership. So when we're talking about um, forming these, uh, you know, reasons why we would do the partnership or not, like I said, the self-employment tax is kind of the big problem that we see here. So what we tend to do in order to sort of um, manage the self-employment tax ex uh, expense more is that we would form an S corporation. However, S corporations in and of themselves are not necessarily good to start in the beginning. Um, particularly if you're expecting that you're going to have some losses in the first year or two, you might want to keep it away from being an S corporation and instead, you know, you know, if you're a sole proprietor, leave it as a sole proprietorship on Schedule C. And if you are an LLC with two or more members, you might leave it as a partnership because if you get the losses, the cool thing about it is it flows right on your tax return. You get to take the loss immediately, reduce your tax liability. Life is good. Um, with an S corporation, yeah, you may, you'll get some of that same treatment, but then you also have payroll expenses you're supposed to be doing. You also have distribution rules that you have to follow. And so generally speaking, we don't tend to get to there until people start making some money. And then we say, okay, now you want to be an S corporation because we want to we want to manage that self employment tax issue a little bit more. <clears throat> um, you know, but another reason why you would want to use a partnership is real estate activities. Um, as we've talked about in the past, uh, real estate, by its definition, according to Code Section four sixty nine, subsection C, 
um, is required, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the partnership, is, I mean, I, the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the code section requires that rental real estate activities, by definition, are passive unless you qualify for the rental real estate professional exception. And what ends up happening is uh, partnerships uh, end up working out really good because all, I mean, like I said, rental real estate activities are passive by nature. If you leave them as passive, they're not subject to the self-employment tax. And so there's no need to form a corporation in order to, ma to manage those self-employment tax rules. Second reason why we sometimes don't recognize, or, I mean, don't, don't recommend um, S corporations for rental activities also has to do with the fact that um, moving property into and out of a corporation, be it an S corporation or a C corporation, generally has significant tax consequences that we like to avoid. Putting partner putting property into and out of a partnership is pretty easy, and so we can we 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 tend to like to leave um, partnerships the way that they are. Um, it, when we're dealing with rental activities, like I said, there's no self-employment tax issue as a result of which we don't usually have that kind of a cost. Okay. Um, now there's going to be certain times where you're not going to have a choice. They have to do a, um, a partnership and, and there are certain, certain times where it's going to be a regulatory requirement. And there's also going to be certain times where it's, it's a rule that they have because that maybe they're a franchisee. Um, very good example. I remember um, one of my first jobs I was looking at when I was leaving the military back in 2011. Uh, I had actually put it out there that I wanted. In, I, I had made the full commitment to the fact that I wanted to get into being a CPA. Um, <clears throat> so about two years before I was getting out in 2010, I actually reached out to um, two insurance agencies, one State Farm and the other one Allstate. And it asked them if I could purchase um, an agency, uh, you know, and start a business. And, and, and of course, they were very happy to, uh, to, to walk me through some of the processes of that. And um, I came very, very close to going through the State Farm route. And the only reason why I didn't actually end up doing State Farm, um, they were going to force me to do a, um, a sole proprietorship Schedule C, no S corporation, no LLC, and in my personal opinion, I thought it was too dangerous. Um, and and we, we had a few words about it. And I said, fine, I'm not going to work with you. Now, the cool thing about Allstate, Allstate didn't have any problems with that. They said, you want to be an S corporation? Fine, it's your issue, not ours. As long as you sell our product, we don't care. Um, I don't know why State Farm requires us to be S, uh, Schedule C's. Nobody ever gave me a full an, uh, understanding or answer on it. Actually, if you do a Google on it, I, I don't, I'm trying to figure out if it would still have the thing. Um, I think, yeah, there's, they're still having, um, I mean, technically it's a, yeah, I'm trying to think. Yeah. It's not as much as it used to be when I first started on this and I was doing Google searches on it, I would actually say, you know, state farm business model. It would talk about why using an LLC, um, was not allowed. Um, and so, you know, what ends up happening is, um, maybe they've changed that policy. I don't know, but I remember in the past, uh, if you wanted to do an LLC, it was pretty much a show, showstopper. They didn't want you to do it. And according to them, well, if you got a good insurance policy, you don't need to worry about it. I get that. But, you know, my lawyer is not telling me the same answer. And when my lawyer who I pay to be in my interest, uh, doesn't tell me that answer, I have a problem with it. So anyways, um, going back to this. We're going to talk about forming and operating partnerships. So first of all, uh, flow through entities. We talked about that. I said this is a specialty that you can get into where you talk about partnerships and S-Corps. Uh, most people don't have enough business to do solely S-Corps or solely partnerships. Usually if you're a flow through person, because the S-Corp has so many aspects of partnership tax in it, you're going to have to know both of them anyway. So you might as well just be a, you know, be the flow through person. And so this is actually one that I, I was, when I worked at small accounting firms, this is where I specialized. Uh, I love flow through entities because, because there's a lot of um, possible uh, good possibilities out of it. <clears throat> income earned by flow through entities, not taxed at the entity level. So this, the, one of the things you're going to see throughout these entire chapters that we talk about this, you're going to have entity level treatment, and then you're going to have um, individual treatment. And 
the entity level versus individual level is always kind of a little bit of a conflict as to who is required to do certain things um, and and certain actions. For example, there's certain elections that you that you can make as a partnership, and then there's certain elections that you have to make as a partner. And so, um, you know, and this is why it's kind of important to have, you know, and let me step back. This is the, one thing that you're going to see that's pervasive throughout this entire um, section. Operating agreements are critical to a partnership. If you do a tax return without looking at the operating agreement of the partnership, you are in uh, my personal opinion, it's malpractice. You should be looking at the operating agreement. If they don't have an operating agreement, you should go tell the owners they need to go get one. Uh, not that I'm saying that you wouldn't do the tax return without one, but, um, you know, and a very good example, I, I just had a client, we ended up doing their final tax return. The, the, the partnership ended up not working out. Um, but what had happened was they they formed the, and they formed the partnership basically like anybody else. Hey, partner, want to work together? Yeah, sure, let's go form an LLC. Form an LLC and that was it. But they never actually set up an operating agreement. And in the first year, I told them, yeah, I'm okay with that. But by next year, I want you guys to have an operating agreement or I'm not going to do the tax return. And when I kind of explained it to them, they, they, they went out and they actually got an operating agreement. An operating agreement basically is just certain agreements that all partners set out. Um, if you want to think of partnership as a marriage, the operating agreement is kind of like a prenup. Um, you know, where you're kind of sitting out and saying, look, this is what I'm bringing into the marriage. This is what you're bringing into the marriage. This is how we're going to operate the marriage. If any certain things take place while we're in the marriage and you don't act on good faith, I'm going to have these kinds of remedies and actions that I can do with you. And, and look, I'm going to tell you something, just like getting a prenup prior to a marriage is a very sensitive subject. Uh, getting an operating agreement prior to a partnership is a very sensitive subject. Because the first thing that ends up happening is, oh, what, what, you don't trust me? And it's like, well, it's not about you that I don't trust. It's the other guy. But I don't know which one I've got, so we're going to go get an operating agreement anyways. So, you know, my recommendation is you always want to get the operating agreement. And sometimes one partner wants an operating agreement and the other one doesn't. And, if, and the CPA can kind of break the tie where we say, look, go get an operating agreement. Um, it's something that that they should do in, in order to get it because there's a, there's so many things that are going to be addressed in that operating agreement that you need to have a clear understanding of. And so we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to various aspects of this. But, you know, talking about this, owners of the flow throughs are taxed on the entity level share of income allocated to them. Now, what will happen with this? This right here is called Schedule K-1. I'll see if I can expand this a bit. Okay, I did it. Good. So this is Schedule K-1. And you'll kind of notice here you've got this box one, which says ordinary business income and loss. And then you have net rental income, blah, 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 so on and so forth. Now, you might want to say to yourself, why in the world is it that we have all of these different categories? And the reason is, is that if, I, if you're a sole proprietorship, there, it's not difficult for me to be able to say, look, as a sole proprietor, your your business, say say you're a sole proprietor and you 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 were subject to a business tax in Germany on your business on your income in Germany, and we'll say it was at ten thousand dollars, and your overall income is at a hundred thousand dollars, and you pay taxes in Germany on that ten thousand dollars in the equivalent amount of about three grand, okay, which actually is kind of low. Normally Germany would probably be about four or five actually, but we'll say it's three grand. You want to get that foreign tax credit. So it's not hard for me to do that if, if you're a Schedule C. I just take it. I put it on your 1116. I say this is how much income they taxed in Germany on this person. They pay $3,000 in tax. They go through the whole form, determine how much of it is, is, is allowed to be taken as a foreign tax credit this time. Um, what ends up happening is um, that's not hard to do. But when you start taking this in and trying to flow it through um, on, onto a partner's tax return, we have to have all those things broken out. Now, what will end up happening, so we have Form 1065, whoops. Uh, 
All right, so they're they're. I guess I get. Wow, this is interesting. I've never actually seen this. Okay. All right. So I guess I guess that yeah yeah this is interesting. I didn't, I didn't actually see that before. So this is the partnership tax return. Um, we're gonna get to this form called Schedule K. Now, Schedule K, as you can see, and I'm going to blow this up a lot and get rid of that stinking Adobe thing. We're not going to use Adobe on this one. Um, you'll see that they have here Ordinary Business Income Loss, Line 1. And then you go over here, and you see that the – oops, I don't know why I locked it, but anyways um, – so you see line one, ordinary business, ordinary business and income loss. And then you have here, ordinary business and income loss. So all of these lines that you have on your on your schedule K1 are going to correspond to schedule K on the partnership tax return. The difference is that the, the schedule K is going to show everything at the aggregate level. So L partner stuff is going to go on this one form. And that way, when the IRS takes a look at it, they want to make sure that everything's being allocated correctly, they can pull up a partnership schedule K and compare that to the individual's K-1. And if things line up the way that they're supposed to line up, everything's great. We don't have to worry about it. So that's, that's kind of how this whole thing works out. And so what happens is that on the individual's tax return, various aspects of the tax, of, of the tax aspects of the income received, very good example is interest income. Interest doesn't go on a business tax return. It's not subject to self-employment tax. Interest goes on an individual's K-1 here for line five, which will flow through to their Schedule B. Okay, so that's kind of the reason why they do a lot of this sort of stuff. And so, and so that's, you know, there is a method to the madness. Um, now, I'm not going to lie to you. This is not a perfect form. There's been a lot of times where I've seen um, certain aspects of tax that get treated um, differently. Um, if you have a person who has actually do, knows what they're doing when it comes to a lot of these partnerships, they'll do things correctly. But every single one of these boxes that you have on here can have a significant tax effect on the entity. Okay, good example, is the person a general partner or is the person a limited partner? Those have different aspects of that, and we'll talk about that later on. What's the profit and loss? percentages what's the capital percentages and we'll talk a little bit about that um later on okay so you have the aggregate and the entity concepts the entity approach basically says it treats partnerships as entities separate from their partners and the aggregate approach treats partnerships as an aggregation of partner separate interests in the assets and liabilities of partnership and both of these take take effect but it all but it depends on what you're talking about there are certain aspects of, of, of taxation that will take an entity approach and certain that will take an aggregate approach. Okay. Uh, partnerships don't, take, don't pay taxes. They, they reflect the aggregate approach for the most part. There are certain areas where there is an entity approach taken um, uh, for their taxations. Okay. Um, again, this is where you see the, the, um, the entity concept. Uh, that for a lot of the most of the tax elections, there's also an aspect in international tax where it takes it at the entity level too, because what ends up happening is, you know, maybe you've got a, um, a partner, you know, you, maybe you've got a partner who, uh, who's a foreign national. And as a result of which there's a withholding requirement that has to be done at the internet, uh, at the, at the entity level. And so you need to make sure that you're keeping up with that, um, with, with regards to all of that. Acquiring a partnership interest is when, is when it's formed. When a partnership is formed, partner may transfer cash, other tangible or intangible property and services into it. There's actually some, um, you know, and it's kind of funny because corporations, I would say, when, when I took corporations at American University, um, we spent most of our time in the statute. We didn't spend a whole lot of time in the regulations just because the statute is pretty well developed. 
Um, when it comes to partnerships, we didn't spend a whole lot of time in the statute. We spent more time in the IRS regulations because that's where the rubber sort of meets the road here. So when we talk about a lot of the stuff, you know, for example, contributing part property to a partnership, taking property out of a partnership, we tend to focus on what the IRS regulations say as opposed to um, what the statute says. Now, the regulations reflect the statute. It's not like we're completely ignoring law. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, is that the statute, I mean, the, 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 the regulations are so well developed, I feel, and you know, I think part of the reason why is because IRS has gotten burned uh, on a couple cases and wanted to make sure that they, they had things set up correctly in order to, um, to make sure that everything is done crystal clear and above board. Partnership rights, you have a right to receive the share in the partnership assets if they were to liquidate called a capital interest. And then you have the right or obligation to receive a share of future profits called a profit interest. Now, there is a very, very um, well-known case in the, um, in the partnership realm where the IRS, this is where the IRS kind of got a little, you know, and forgive the provocative term, but this is where the IRS got spanked. And it was actually, it's actually kind of good, you know, I mean, not that I'm, not that I'm anti-IRS, but, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of nice to see sometimes the beast can be slayed um, because there's sometimes where I think they, they, they strong arm some of our clients and I'm like, I really wish we could get them. But um, there's been, there was this, this is a time where the IRS kind of got, got, got beat on this. And what happened was, is that in, in, in a case where a person had received a profits interest um, in a partnership, didn't receive any capital interest, but received a profits interest in a partnership, uh, the IRS tried to charge them taxes on that partnership received at that time. And the courts kind of came back and said, look, you can't do that. And part of the reason why is because you can't value what the partnership interest is um, in, this, in this entity. Okay, you have no idea. And as a result of which, you can't tell them how much tax they're going to have to pay. What's the what's what's the what's the value of a profit interest once it's handed to you? You don't know because you don't know what the profit future profitability is. And if you do know, you better hand that crystal ball to me so I can make some money too. Uh, because because that's the thing. It's the only way you're ever going to know. So so they came back and said, look, you can't do that. However, if you try to give a person a capital interest in exchange for their services that's going to be taxed to them as compensation. And the IRS is pretty clear about that, that it will be taxed as compensation because the idea is, is that you are being compensated for services that you are going to render or have rendered. And then they're going to tax it as compensation, subject not only to employment tax, uh, I'm sorry, subject to income tax, but also employment taxes. So partners who contribute services instead of property frequently receive only profits interest, and that's the reason why. It's not taxable today, it's taxable in the future like everybody else, and so it's a good way in order to, uh, to get people in. And sometimes what happens, you know, like a very good example, and, and usually when we're in class, I'll give you the example. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll talk about this later on when we, when we get to class next week. Um, but we, we, I always talk about um, the old rich uncle, um, you know, who works in D.C. and has money but doesn't want to own he doesn't want to work at a mcdonald's but has a nephew that they love or a niece that they love and they're going to give them a whole bunch of money to open a mcdonald's and um so they'll contribute you know so they have a so basically what happens is one person's all the money one person's all the services and what you're going to do if if, if you have a good accountant and a good lawyer is they're going to say give the kid only a profit interest not a capital interest because if you give them a capital interest you're going to run into the fact that they're going to be in some trouble uh, tax-wise. So we, we want to make sure that we do that. Contributions of property depends on the transactions. Uh, realized gains and losses of the property are either fully or partially deferred for tax purposes. So, for example, um, we'll say 60 years ago, um, my grandfather, before passing away, gave me a piece of land. Okay. Okay. Uh, so he gives me a piece of land and he says, okay, you know, it, it's something that when he bought it, it was, you know, $500 cause he bought it, you know, you know, he got it from his, well, actually we'll just, we'll say it's, we'll just say this is a piece of land that's been handed down in family to family. And so, uh, it, it originally was farmland. Uh, my grandfather's grandfather gave it to him. Now he's giving it to me. Um, the city has grown around this land now. 
And so now that land is far more valuable. And so when it was given to me, uh, and when it says 60, we'll say 20 years ago, um, it was worth $10,000 and now it's worth, you know, $200,000. I want to contribute that land to the partnership in exchange for a capital interest. Okay. What's going to end up happening is I will have a capital interest and 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 there's and, and I'm kind of sidestepping a lot of topics that get into this, but from a tax basis, it's it's in your and this is the phrase you got to understand. This is one of our favorite phrases that we say in uh, the taxation world: basis given is basis received. Again, basis given is basis received. If we were in class, I'd kind of do the whole sing songy thing: basis given is basis received. Basis given is basis received. Okay, so once you have that uh, that concept understood. What I'm giving to the company, so the basis at the time that it was given to them is the $10,000 that it was valued at when, it, when my grandfather gave it to me upon his death. Okay, say, say it was willed to me. So at, at the time of death, you know, $10,000. It's now worth $200,000. I put it into the partnership. From a tax perspective, I will receive a partnership interest. The basis in that partnership will be $10,000. It will not be the $200,000 that I've given. Now, if... The partnership goes ahead and says, yeah, we don't need this land, but we need cash. We'd like to sell this land and get cash. Um, so we're going to sell for $200,000. And they go out and they sell it. Well, does that mean that the, that the, that the, uh, the partnership then, and say there's, there's five partnerships, each one of us owning 20%. Does that mean that my capital gains effect goes from 100% of what the capital gains was down to 20%? Because we're going to spread the other you know, uh, 80% to the other five partners? And the answer is no, because, and that's what we call the big rules, built-in gain, B-I-G, uh, the, 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 the notorious B-I-G of taxation, which is built-in gains. Sorry, bad pun, I know. I'm a dad, I've got dad jokes like you wouldn't believe. Um, but it's, it's, it's the notorious B-I-G, built-in gains. And so what ends up happening is that those gains, because I contributed it at that time and it was worth $200,000 versus $10,000, that $190,000 of gain, $190,000 of gain that the corporate, that the partnership recognizes, I have to recognize directly to me, okay? Now, if there's any gains that have happened between the time that I contributed to the partnership and later on, that is recognized at the entity level and then split out amongst the partners. Now, if the, if the partnership owns the land for a specified amount of time, and I believe it's five years, I think it's still five years, um, the built-in gains repercussions go away. There's, no, there's nothing to do. And the reason why the IRS put this in there is what they don't want to have happen is they don't want gain shifting uh, taking place. They don't want gain ta they don't want taxes, tax gains happening as a result of all this. So what will end up happening is that they'll, they'll say you put it in, you dispose of it within the specified amount of time, you're going to have to apportion those gains back to that individual um, uh, inappropriate for that. So, so you know, here they say, uh, you know, Again, con contribution of property, depending on the transaction, gains, loss, blah, blah, blah. So similar to the rationale for permitting tax deferral treatment when corporations are formed. And, and when, we didn't, I don't think we really talked too much about this in forming corporations, but there's a code section called 351. Code section 351 basically says, look, if you contribute property to a corporation in exchange for, um, for shares, um, we're not going to tax you on the on the on the on the contribution of that uh to the corporation in exchange for the shares however the basis in the shares that you have is going to remain whatever the basis that you gave to the corporation again basis given is basis received basis given is basis received um so you want to make sure that uh that, you, that you're kind of following that and he follows the aggregate theory of partnership taxation again uh, more justification Gain and loss recognition, any of the partners recognize gain and loss from contributed partner, property of partnerships. Uh, definition of property includes a wide variety of both tangible and intangible assets, but not services. Also includes cash. They didn't put that out there. I mean, I guess that would be tangible assets. But again, cash is a very common thing that ends up happening. I have $30,000. You got $30,000. Let's put it together. We'll go buy a house, and we'll see if we can make some money. Um very common thing. In fact, I'm working with a group of people right now who's going to form a partnership uh, to 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 perform services here in the in the Herndon area. And you know, one of them is contributing cash. The other one is contributing the know-how of what's going on. 
uh, we've agreed to do the, the capital goes 100 percent to the person contributing cash and the profits are going to be split. Uh, in this case, it's going to be split 33 percent per partner because there's going to be a total of three partners. So it's going to be stuff like that. Uh, the general rule facilitates uh, contribution of property with built-in gains. Again, we've talked a little bit about that, the notorious BIG. Um, general rule discourages contributions of properties with built-in losses. I totally agree with this. Um, you know, if you have a built-in loss, more likely than not, the person is going to want to um, dispose of the property and just contribute cash. Um, at least if they're tax smart, they are. Now, if the if the if, if if the partnership has an actual specific use for the land, maybe they don't want to do that. Maybe they just say, "Look, I'll contribute the land. It's worth less than what I've originally bought it for." They'll receive some other form of compensation as a result of which maybe they get a guaranteed payment. Okay, they they can. There's different ways that they can do that in order to get compensated for their losses that they have. Um, but, you know, if the business needs that land, say that land is located right across the street from, uh, you know, say, for example, I'm going to build a partnership that's got a restaurant and it's going to be right across the street from, um, you know, a, a major assembly plant that's being built. Um, obviously, we don't want to sell the land. We want to use the land or to be able to plop a restaurant, restaurant right outside that assembly plant. And we're going to make more money than we know what to do with. Um, that's kind of how this ends up working out. Partner's initial tax basis. Uh, so you're required to calculate the initial the, the taxable gains and losses when they sell their partnership interest. Um, tax initial tax basis when the partnership doesn't have any debt. Some of tax basis of property and cash contributed. So if I contribute cash of twenty thousand dollars, again basis given is basis received. I then receive uh, the basis of whatever I give. And basis of cash is fair market value of cash. The only thing that we have were fair market value and um, and basis always, always, always match. And that's when it's cash. Um, again, you know, if, if, if there's any debt instruments, this is where it kind of gets a little wonky. Um, I will have to, uh, I'll probably have to save that for another class where we kind of talk a little bit about that more in detail. Okay, so there is, there's the debt. I'm going to hold off on that just because of the fact that um, if you receive some sort of death, debt relief, what ends up happening is, is that it'll actually change your debt, your your basis uh, in your partnership. Because what's happening is, you know, and, and maybe I'll go through a, a minor example right now. So, for example, I have a plot of land, and we'll say that the plot of land I bought for two hundred thousand dollars using a loan. Of that loan, I have uh, ten thousand dollars of that loan left. I contribute the land to the partnership with the 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 loan in 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 receipt. So I bought it for $200,000, there's $10,000 of debt left on it. My basis in that partnership now is $190,000. And I don't think anyone has a hard time understanding the math there. Um, contribute the land, $200,000 basis, $10,000 of debt relief, it's going to be a reduction. Now, what happens if I contribute that land and say, for example, I contribute land at $200,000, but instead of $10,000 of debt, I have $300,000 of debt. Now I'm going to ask the partnership to relieve me of that debt and take the land. What will happen is, is that I'll have my basis, basis given is $200,000 minus $300,000. So I have a negative $100,000, can't have negative basis. What will happen is, is that I will have to receive um, some form of uh, taxable income as a result of that. And if I'm correct, I think it is, uh, it's, I believe it's capital gains because it's considered a distribution and excess of basis. Um, but in this case, because you've owned the partnership, if you've owned the partnership for less than a year, it's short-term capital gain, which means it's taxed at ordinary rates. Uh, again, this is why you want to make sure that you, you, your, your people have your tax professionals before you do the stuff that you're going to do. Um, let's see. We, yeah, we've got 10 minutes. I'm going to talk about um, three different types of debt. Actually, let me hold off on that part there. I want to pull up the K1 again. So that's the wrong one. This is the one. Okay. So you take a look at the K1 here, and you see, I'm going to blow this up a bit just so we can make sure that everyone sees it. You see this portion right here. Well, they kind of talk about, I'm sorry, I'm a bad drawer when I've got my tracker ball. 
But this is where they're going to talk about partner share of liabilities. Now, with, with partner share of liabilities, you'll have um, uh, basically what happens is you've got this non-recourse, qualified recourse financing, and recourse. So let's talk about the, the, the two big ones first, non-recourse and recourse. Recourse debt, by its definition, is, is debt that, as a partner, I have personally guaranteed. So, for example, if the partnership goes out and they borrow a million dollars, say we're going to say, uh, you know, I contribute $100,000 and I get four other people to contribute $100,000. We have a total of $500,000. We're going to go buy a building for $1.5 million. We're all going to be 20% owners in the building. And so we go to the, we go to the bank and we say, look, we want to borrow a million bucks and forget forget the qualified recourse financing for a minute there but say it doesn't exist and i say okay um we're going to borrow this money and and the bank says you know kevin it's in a part of town that we're a little bit concerned we'd be happy to use the land as collateral but we don't know if it's going to be a good enough collateral in order for you to get the million dollars we're going to require each of your partners to personally guarantee the debt up to a certain portion and then what happens is, uh, so you, you go ahead and you sign the thing and says, look, if the partnership itself can't pay the debt, they can come after me, and then uh, then I'll go ahead and I'll pay my portion of the debt as a result of which. And that's a very common thing that you actually see in the uh, in the in the world. Even if they don't have any concerns about the value of the property, banks are very 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 risk adverse, and as a result of which, if they can get away in order to make sure that they're going to get their money, they're going to make sure it happens before they step into the transaction. Now, if they have an extraordinary amount of, of, of experience in lending to you, they know that you've been good, you always pay your bills on time, there's never been a concern, they'll probably be willing to do this. But again, um, more likely than not, especially in the beginning, they're going to require that you have to have some form of recourse. Now, non-recourse basically says the partnership is liable for the debt, but the partners are not. Uh, a very good example, of ver a very common example of um, of uh, partnership debt that is not um, that's non recourse is accounts payable. So, for example, I'm I'm here in my office right now. I have the lights on, so obviously I have pay I've hired Dominion uh, Electric to turn my electricity on, provide me electricity so that I can come to you guys live at 7:30 in the morning, um, and and all that stuff. Uh, luckily they can't, they're not recording my picture there on, on here. It's just, it's just the, uh, the slides and all that. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, the, the thing is, is that, um, uh, you know, if, if, if my partners, if this was a partnership and it went belly up, Dominion really wouldn't have any recourse to come after me personally, unless I had signed a statement saying that I was willing to do that. So that's a very common non-recourse that you're going to see. Another common non-recourse that you would see is credit card debt. If the partnership has a credit card and the per and the person involved doesn't have any um, direct liability on it, more likely than not, there's not going to be um, a, a recourse option for that. Now there could be. We, we could make you liable, and as if that were to happen, it would become recourse. So what ends up happening is. Um, and here, here's where it kind of comes up. All of this debt that you have, regardless of where the debt comes from, is going to grant you debt basis. Okay, this is a very common misunderstanding in the um, in the in the partnership world. And actually, it was funny because I didn't realize I was being taught the wrong thing when I first got into uh, taxation. But the person that I was working for told me it was non-recourse debt. You don't get debt basis for it. It's actually false. What happens is with non-recourse debt, you'll get the debt basis, but there's going to be an at-risk limitation that's going to take place. And we'll talk about that later on. That's going to require a little bit more than the four minutes that we have left of class. Okay. So non-recourse debt and recourse debt, you're going to get debt basis. However, you also have this qualified non-recourse financing. Qualified non-recourse financing, it's actually mortgage financing, and it will grant you at-risk, um, uh, it will get you, get you to the past the at-risk limitations, partially because what happens is, and where, where qualified non-recourse financing is usually done for real estate, 
That's why I told you in the example, forget the fact that we're building, buying a building or, or don't, don't think about the qualified recourse financing and that non-recourse financing in that case. So in a traditional non -re, in a traditional real estate transaction, the first thing that's going to happen if the de debt defaults, the bank gets the building. And that's, and that's what they're going to want. They're going to say, look, we're going to, we'll secure this loan with the underlying bank, with the underlying building that you're going to buy. So the way the IRS looks at it is they say, look, first of all, we want to encourage people to do real estate financing and encourage people to do real estate investing. Um, a million dollars that's, that's forced to be non-recourse financing or recourse financing, I mean, non-recourse financing. They didn't want to have a situation where it hampers people from investing um, in the real estate market. So they created this different category that basically says, yeah, it, it's non-recourse financing, but think of it this way. If the bank, if the if the partnership goes belly up and can't pay its loan, what's going to end up happening is they're going to take that building away from them. And that's a pretty significant event. Uh, I've never been through a, 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 um, a foreclosure. I came this close to having one. Um, you know, many years ago, um, luckily it didn't, it, you know, we, we ended up getting out of it. It wasn't a big deal. Uh, we had, we had some financial issues that were kind of going on at the time and, uh, we pulled ourselves out of it. We, we, you know, we worked with the bank and did some refinancing in order to get it done, but losing a house or losing a building is a pretty significant event. And so the IRS has kind of sat back and said, look, we're going to grant some special relief here. And so that's why they came up with this qualified non-recourse financing. It has to be a mortgage property and, uh, and it has to meet certain other uh, requirements and, and, and things of that nature. All right. So it's uh, 844. I know most of you are probably like, oh, my God, please let this guy stop talking. Uh, but I wanted to say to you guys, uh, thank you very much for still being here. I'm pleasantly surprised. Um to be honest, when I started realizing I was going to, I actually let me let me turn this off here real quick.